Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Bruce Nixon, MD. Dr. Bruce Nixon is a radiologist with the Washington Hospital Healthcare System. Dr. Nixon did his undergraduate studies at UC Berkeley. He went to medical school at Penn State University and then on to UCLA for his internship. He attended Stanford University Medical Center for his residency in diagnostic radiology, followed by a fellowship in CT, MRI, and ultrasound at Stanford. Dr. Nixon is a board-certified radiologist by the American Board of Radiology. Radiation safety is something that's been in the news lately, and I'm sure you've seen it uh, about a year ago or so. Uh, some of the uh, some radiologists got a little overzealous in, in Los Angeles and, and started to uh, uh, take CAT scans that were... Uh, how should I say, they were doing, they were trying to make a study to publish in a journal and they wanted to make the pictures really very beautiful. So they just sort of overrode the normal factors that you use and, and um, scanned the people very, very heavily. And they, there was hair loss. There was enough to cause hair loss. Now this probably didn't permanently damage the patients, but it caused an alarm and, and the, the government got quite uh, excited about it and, and a lot of things have happened since then. But anyway, uh, we are addressing that uh, concern today to answer any questions you might have and explain a little bit about radiology. Uh, just from an historical perspective, uh, <coughs> Conrad Rankin was a physicist. He kind of looks like most of the physicists I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and he was, uh, back in those days, you know, electricity wasn't that new. Uh, I mean, it was pretty new, rather. It wasn't that accepted. He was playing with cathode ray tubes. They, were, they found that if you transmit electricity through a vacuum tube, you, they could, uh, uh, it could transmit very effectively. And they could do all kinds of uh, fun things in their lab. He, also at that time, photography wasn't, that, uh, uh, wasn't around that long either. So they had a lot of photographic plates made with different chemicals. And it just so happened Apparently, his wife was in his lab, and she had her hand on one of the photographic plates. And he didn't realize, but you know, he was generating, you know, high-energy photons, which are uh, our current day what we call X-rays. And lo and behold, uh, it <laughs> he discovered that there was a picture of his wife's hand with her ring on it. Uh, which is right here before, <laughs> and he said, oh my gosh, where did this come from? He had no idea where the, what had made, taken the picture because, you know, basically the, the tube was here and her hand was over here somewhere, and he didn't know it, but he had generated x-rays by uh, using very high energy uh, electricity through this cathode ray tube, and it had bombarded a, a high density material and caused these x-rays to form. So he didn't really know what to call them, so they just called them x-rays, right? Just like x, like you, uh, like an unknown. Uh, <clears throat> so that was the beginning of, uh, of radiology. And of course, uh, good old American uh, entrepreneurship, uh, they immediately, you know, got into crazy things, and promising people the world and see-through clothes and <laughs> all this other kind of stuff that you see here. <clears throat> but one thing they did notice is that and they were quick to capitalize on this, is that uh, 
<coughs> in those days, the x-ray machines, of course, were very small, right? Today, they're huge, but they were for small, so you would really concentrate on, on things like your feet, your hands, so forth. So they, somebody said, well, gee, we could probably sell a lot of shoes by x-raying people's feet and showing it to them and say, hey, we can tailor make a shoe just perfect for your foot. So in the, in the early days, they were just using it. The, they had no idea that x-rays could do any damage. They just thought it was a, a cool kind of little trick um, found in the lab. <coughs> uh, so these, this would be an example of an early uh, x-ray machine. They're, they're x-raying this, this guy's arm. They're very small. This, this person <laughs> is looking there is, is looking directly. He's getting radiated directly into his eyes. But of course, it's sort of like smoking, right? We didn't know smoking killed for a long time, right? Nobody thought much about it. And it was the same as, as x-rays. Didn't know that they had, there was any danger associated with them. Uh, here is an example of a, of a unit used in the, uh, in the Army in the 30s. This is looking at his chest, probably. Anyway, so that is one source of, of radiation, of x-rays. X-ray, x basically, are uh, photons, high-energy photons, electromagnetic radiation. As you know, there's radio waves and other things that are, we don't, we're not worried about. But when the <coughs> wavelength gets small enough, uh, the energy of the, of the uh, radiation becomes greater. And uh, that's what x-rays uh, are. They're very, very high energy. So <coughs> we get radiation, x-radiation, from different sources. Uh, we have some that come through the atmosphere. If you go on an airplane trip, you probably all have heard you get, you know, uh, radiation, like, I don't know what it, what it amounts to, but it, something like five flights is enough, the same as a chest x-ray, that kind of thing, across country. You get them from the ground. Radon is a naturally occurring uh, material, uh, heavy metal that uh, radiates um, x-rays. Uh, some places, like in Denver and other Midwest places, they get a lot of radiation from the ground. And there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, you can uh, you just it just emanates. Here is not a very high uh, radon level, uh, but you get it through the air. You can get it through drinking. I mean, it's just all over the place. Your average background radiation exposure per person in the United States is three millisieverts a year. It's also called 300 millirams. It's the just like in inches and centimeters and degrees in Celsius and Fahrenheit, the Europeans have decided they're going to start a new calibration system. So we used to use rems and millirems, and now they're making us convert to millisieverts and sieverts. For whatever reason, there's a factor of 100 difference. But <coughs> anyway, uh, 300 millirams is what we get per year, average background. If you, um, if you then add the average man-made source from all your radiation exposure from x-rays and so forth, it comes up to about 360. Uh, millirems from 300. So it's about 20% of all the radiation you get, on average, uh, is from uh, medical sources. Here's a little pie chart breakdown. So natural background is 82%. Then there's about 20% is man-made. And of that man-made radiation, you have medical x-rays are over 50%. Nuclear medicine, which is, many of you probably have had a nuclear medicine exam, like a bone scan or something like that, is 21%. Uh, it's also man-made, of course. Uh, various consumer products. Uh, for instance, you know, remember the radon dial, watch dials used to have in the old days? Those emitted, you know, those, those workers actually got bone cancer from working with it. Uh, uh, but uh, those radiated a lot of, of, uh, of radiation, relatively speaking. Uh, they don't make them anymore, of course. Occupational, 2%. Uh, so we do, uh, we do contribute a significant amount to uh, your radiation exposure in the radiology department. So the number of radiographic procedures is increasing quite rapidly, uh, as we'll talk about later. Uh, and the, the procedures that have the highest radiation are CAT scans, and angi angiography for if you if you have an angiogram of your heart, and nuclear medicine. Here's an example of a CAT scanner, which some of you are familiar with. You just uh, it just slides you into the scanner, and the the X-rays are generated uh, through a right in here in this chamber here, and they um, 
they have little tiny emitters that spin around very quickly. And it's a sof pretty sophisticated uh, machine, but um, you, it does generate uh, a lot of radiation. To give you an example, in 1980 there were uh, 30, 3 million exams uh, radiographic, in general for radiographic procedures. Now there are 62 million, uh, or CT scans rather, 62 million scans a year, uh, which is a lot. Uh, so CT accounts for 75% of that medical radiation. And most of these are in, in adults. We try to uh, use as little radiation as possible with children, because as I'll explain later, that's much more dangerous for children to get radiation than, than uh, you or I. So when we, for, these are for CAT scans. When we do CAT scans, look at all the CAT scans that are done. Half of them are of the CAT scan of the body. And those are by far the highest uh, doses that you get. A third of them are the head, which is a, a lower dose. It turns out the brain and the skull are pretty, re, at least mine is, re, no, are pretty resistant to radiation. And most of these are in a hospital setting. With, a, with the children, we use a very, very uh, low doses and a rapid, uh, they move a lot, as you know, so that we do it quickly uh, and we do a low dose just to minimize it, because you'll see later they're the, at most at risk uh, for this. Uh, but they do, um, it has a big impact. For instance, one of the things we use CAT scans for in children the most is to rule out appendicitis because, uh, you know, children come in and they're, you know, you know, you all raise kids, right? They've got severe pain. You don't know what's going on. They don't know what's going on. And you don't really know. You do as much exam as you can, but you really don't know if they have appendicitis, which is the main thing that they get. So it turns out that the CAT scan is really accurate in diagnosing appendicitis. So an emergency room physician will order a CAT scan to make that diagnosis. And it, you know, it's, it's cut down the number of surgeries dramatically in these kids, because a lot of times they just didn't know. Well, we can't exclude appendicitis to go in as a normal appendix. Nowadays, they hardly ever take out a normal appendix. It's extremely unusual. So it's cut down on the, on the, uh, the number of surgeries a great deal. So it's a it's really useful procedure. Screening CTs, we don't really do those much anymore. Um, there's, uh, uh, you can actually look at the colon, uh, although that, that's a lot of radiation and we don't do that. Uh, you can screen for lung cancer, which is, you've probably read about that in, on and off in the paper. Some studies say, oh, it's really good, and some say, no, it's too much radiation, and too much, there are too many false positives and things like that. So that may or may not be coming. Whole body screening is not done anymore. They used to have all those whole body screening things that were set up around the country, and people would walk in without a prescription, and they get radiated, and they wouldn't know what to do with the information. That doesn't happen anymore. It turns out that a lot of physicians that order the scans aren't aware of the amount of radiation that the patients are getting. Uh, and here a study showed that actually half of the radiologists didn't really know how much radiation the patient was getting, and most of the emergency room physicians didn't know. So they, that's sort of a, not a big consideration for them, but of course it's a consideration for you. So. The main thing, we, there are two things we worry about for, with radiation. One is uh, uh, causing cancer. This is the big one. And the other one, of course, is uh, genetic mutations. So, uh, and that really only if, uh, would affect a patient who's pregnant. So uh, we go to amazing lengths to prevent any pregnant patient from getting radiation. I mean, they have to actually, uh, the physician actually had to beg us to do a CAT scan, and it's, we tried to do ultrasound, anything we can not to radiate a patient. The way that uh, x-rays cause, can cause cancer is that, you may not know this, but every second your body is producing defective cells, right? And there's problems with them, and the body's immune system destroys them. And you go about your merry way, you have no clue, right? Well, <clears throat> once in a while, one of those mutations is such that it can, the cell can still live and it won't be recognized as foreign by, the, by your immune system, and it, and it, but it loses its ability to control its, its replication cycle. So it can, just nothing can turn it off. It just keeps growing and growing and growing, and it's called a tumor, right? <clears throat> and if it's, uh, if it's a tumor, that can spread somewhere else in your bloodstream, then it's malignant and it, it can kill you, right? So anyway, uh, radiation, photons, can actually
cause similar breaks in the DNA, which is this little diagram you have here. So here's the radiation coming in, and it causes uh, breaks in, in, in the DNA. And once in a while, and most of the time, the, the damaged cells will get recognized as, as damaged, and they'll be destroyed by the body. But obviously, the more you radiate, the more times you have radiation, and it's cumulative over a, over a lifetime, one, there's a chance that one of these will turn into a tumor, right, or in a malignant tumor. So that's what we really worry about the most. But to put it in perspective, this chart sort of speaks for itself. Um, so this is the number of uh, years, on average, somebody loses in their lifespan from doing these various activities. All right, so smoking we know is bad. So that, that knocks off, in average, six years of your life. Uh, being overweight, it doesn't say for how long, but I assume it means lifetime, 15% at least overweight, two years. U.S. average alcohol consumption is one year. And so here is occupational radiation. All right, this is what we limit our people who work in the field, like myself or technologists. We live, limit them to 300 millirems per year. If you get that throughout your career, you're, you on average will lose 15 days of your life. And then occupational uh, dose, if you get the maximum, it would uh, limit, knock it down by 51 days. So our natural incidence of cancer is 42%, just in general. So it, in, it increases it slightly. They think it'll increase it to like 42.8%, something like that. But it's, it's, it's small, but it's significant if it's, if it's you. And these are the kind of uh, factors that contribute to uh, uh, the loss of, uh, shortening of your lifespan. So the type of radiation is important. The type of part of the body that's exposed is important. Uh, and uh, your age and exposure and overall health all affect you. So this is the, the first one is the sto stochastic effect. That's the genetic mutation I talked about. And then the other one is non-stochastic, -sto which is the direct cell death and cancer, cause of cancer. So they say that no amount of radiation exposure uh, is without risk. And it's, this is a statistical thing. They, they can look, I'll go into it a little bit later, but um, Basically, the more you have and the longer you have it over your life pan, the greater risk it is for you. When there's a high radiation dose, for instance, radiation therapy, you have other risks. You have immediate acute uh, risks of uh, damage to your intestines, uh, your marrow, things like that. We're not going to talk about that uh, today because that's a very, very select group of, of people uh, and they know the risks going in. They, they're informed of the risks and uh, the benefits out, outweigh the risks in their situations because they really need the radiation therapy. Uh, but the most sensitive part of your body is actually your marrow. Uh, that's the most rapidly proliferating part of your body, the, the white blood cells especially. Uh, and so leukemia is, a, is a, one of the cancers that, that we see the most. This is the radiation you get from these, these procedures. And what they do is they list in, in millisieverts, which probably doesn't mean much to any of you, uh, but then they equivalent it, uh, equilibrate it to the equivalent of a chest x-ray, all right? So here, a chest x-ray is equivalent to one chest x-ray of exposure. And also then they um, compare it to how many days of background radiation uh, there are. So it's one chest x-ray is, is equivalent to 10 days of background, normal background radiation. And then it goes down the line here uh, with uh, the mammogram is equivalent to 70 days, um, and then and so forth. And then you get, you can see as you get into the uh, CAT scans, it's much higher. So here you have an ab CT scan is, of the abdomen is equivalent to three years of background radiation, or about one, one rem. Radiation is a little more risky for women than men. Uh, they have uh, their breasts are glandular structures. They're producing, the, anytime you mess with any kind of a glandular structure in your abdomen, or your breasts, whatever, it's a more risky, right? Because they're producing things all the time. They're a metabolically active gland and they're, they're more subject to radiation damage. So the children are really at risk uh, for radiation. So their risk is three to four times an adult. 
because they have a longer time for their body to accumulate the radiation and to have a genetic mutation, right? They're also growing. Their cells are growing quicker. They're dividing quicker. They're more subject to radiation uh, damage than ours. Uh, so that's the main reason we need to keep them uh, protected as much as possible. So how do we know what the risk of cancer is? Well, there's a lot of things. We, we uh, Radiation workers, uh, actually early radiologists uh, got leukemia. We sort of knew all these things, but we didn't really know what their exposure was. We just knew that there was an associated increased risk. So really what the big information, most information we got was from the atomic bomb. Uh, and those, there were a lot of patients, of course, or a lot of people exposed. It was all at once. We knew from their location what their exposure was, how far from ground zero it was. And then we followed them, right? There were 25,000 survivors, uh, and we knew what the dose was, you know, based on how far they were. So we looked at those, and uh, it turns out that somebody two miles away from that explosion had the dose equivalent from one cast scan of the abdomen. So you'd think, and most people think of the atomic bomb as, oh my God, you know, if you were two miles away, you were like right near it. But actually the radiation dose was not that, that high. But anyway, we followed them in thyroid cancers and leukemia and things like that. So that's how we got uh, an idea of how many, uh, what the risk of getting cancer would be. Of course, it's one, it's one population, right? One uh, group of people and doesn't necessarily apply to everybody, but we, that's all we really have. Uh, this is uh, reiterating what we saw we saw earlier that the number of CAT scans is going up uh, dramatically from 3 million in 1980 to 62 million in 2009. Uh, and the average personal radiation exposure over background has, in, has, uh, has doubled since that time. Now, I'm sure nobody here is going to agree to any CAT scan the doctor orders after this talk, but uh, you should know that the CAT scan has revolutionized medicine, and it's like you can't imagine living your life now probably without a phone or a cell phone. I mean, it's just like you feel naked, you feel without it. Well, that's the way doctors feel now if they took CAT scans away. So they're very, very dependent on that, and you need to, uh, to listen to them when they recommend one. It's good to question them, make sure that you really need it, because uh, there are factors that, that uh, lead to them ordering them uh, other than the medical use. That sometimes they're uh, afraid of medical legal things like, well, God, if I'm like in the emergency room, you see, you have, see a patient and you don't even know the patient. They, cause sometimes they don't speak English. You're just sort of like trying to figure out what's going on. Well, if they have something that's serious and you don't order a CAT scan and something happens to that patient, some lawyer's gonna come and just nail you, right? I mean, this is just gonna, because a CAT scan is now considered a standard uh, test to order in the workup of, of a lot of patients. So they're in, a, they're in a bind, so they sometimes order things just to be, on the, on, to be careful. And uh, the medical legal issues aside, they just don't wanna miss a significant problem in these patients. So they will order them. Sometimes the patients are very demanding. They, you know, they come in, they say, well, my relative had this, and they came in, and they got this scan, and I want that scan. So the doc, you know, they, they'll go along with it. So it's kind of a, there's a lot more CAT scans. Probably a th maybe a quarter to a third of CAT scans probably could be done without. But, you, you know, just, I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've uh, reported the, to the emergency room, but the CAT scan shows so, something significant, and the doctor says, oh, you're kidding. I was just sort of, I didn't really think there was anything going to be there. I was just being careful, and there's something major. I mean, it, it's, it happens all the time. So it's an amazing test. Uh, so when you need it, you, you should get it. One study should, estimated that 1.5 to 2% of all cancers in the United States may be due to radiation from CAT scans done now. So that's how much of a concern it is to the, to the public health people. Uh, so this study thought that a third of the CAT scans were done because of a uh, lack of communication and defensive medicine, what I was just talking about. Um, and they, the doctors sometimes don't know, they just, they're oblivious to the fact that there's radiation involved. Uh, it's just another test they're ordering, like a blood test, and they don't, they don't think about it, they just try to concentrate on what they're doing. Uh, a third, I don't know, a third is t tough. Uh, 
to do. There are some, I know there are some emergency rooms. I've talked to other radiologists that work in other hospitals, and the number of CAT scans that they get in these other hospitals is enormous. It's, it's staggering. You know, we have the busiest emergency room uh, in, the, in the East Bay except for Highland Hospital, and so our number of CAT scans has definitely gone up over time. So I've been here 25 years. Uh, but when I compare it to some of my buddies in other places, it, it seems very low. So it depends a lot on the doctor, a lot on the environment, the community, what the expectations are, so forth. Uh, it's like any test, whether to order or not is, is sometimes not really clear. So what we try to do is uh, if there's another test that doesn't use ionizing radiation, ionizing radiation is basically x-rays because uh, ionization means you can knock an electron off of an atom and cause damage, right? So non-ionizing uh, radiation is, are things like MRI, which uses magnetic waves, which are much less energetic, and ultrasound uses ultrasound waves. Uh, and sometimes the test can be replaced with those without any uh, damaging radiation. Uh, and we try to do that whenever we can. But uh, there's a constant interaction between the emergency room and, and the radiologist as to if there's any kind of borderline cases, they call us and they go, okay, here's what I'm looking for. What do you think I should order? And these, some of these doctors have, you know, in the ER have been doing this for 25 or 30 years, and yet they still have questions and they want to be careful before they order them. So we, that's part of our job is to, to interact with them and give, us, give them advice. And sometimes it's not totally clear. Uh, you really got to get a better idea of what the history is and what they're really looking for um, before you uh, give them an answer. But we're all on the same page. We'd all like to minimize the number of CAT scans uh, that uh, are done. Um, and you can, if you get additional information, clinical information, you can tailor your test. Um, we have done a lot of physician education lately to educate them as to how much radiation is done. Uh, you know, if we ever see a, a CAT scan ordered on a, on a, 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 a woman of childbearing age or, or a, a child, you know, the technologists frequently bring the exam to us, the request, and say, what do you think? And we'll call the, the, the ER doctor and say, you know, do you really need this, blah, 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 remind them how much radiation it is and so forth. Uh, and that's, that's, those are some of the steps that we are taking to try to minimize it. You said that it's better to get an MRI uh, rather than a CAT scan. Can you? Well, the MRI uses magnetic waves. So if you have something which an MRI can show just as well as a CAT scan, if, what they're looking for, then the MRI gives you less uh, or it gives you no ionizing radiation. It just gives you magnetic waves. Why wouldn't they always use that? Well, MRI has a very localized uh, use. There's, I mean, it sees very specific things. CAT scan will show probably, in terms of the number of uh, disease entities, a CAT scan will show you 100 compared to, say, one for MRI. I mean, it, it's really, it's for your brain, your spine, your joints. It's, it's really, it's localized for that. And lastly, what about dental uh, x-rays? Does that have much of an effect? They haven't been able to show any effect on that. They, uh, just in general, they recommend that the doctor use the new digital, the lower dose digital techniques, uh, but they really haven't shown any kind of, you know, localized effect of that. Do you think somebody, like in their 70s, maybe should have fewer mammograms? Uh, well, that's a totally different topic. Uh, the, the radiation that you get from a mammogram is a different kind. Of, we use a different frequency and power of x-ray, right? It's for just for soft tissues. We don't have to go through bone, right? So uh, there have been a lot of studies on the risks of, of uh, cancer from uh, mammograms. And over a large population, it increases your chances. But on indiv your chances of getting breast cancer when you hit 70 are much higher than when you're 50, right? So the benefits are greater. So you have to look at the benefit uh, ratio. So I, I wouldn't stop getting mammograms because you're afraid of the radiation. It's really very, it's very limited radiation. It's just your, the rest of your body doesn't get any, right? It's just yeah. right to your breast. And your breasts are, when you're 70, your breasts are not glandularly active, right? <laughs> it, it's, right? It's, mo <laughs> it's mostly fat. So it's, it's, it's I wouldn't, yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions. 
How does the gamma knife play into this? What is the difference with mm. the radiation? So gamma knife is, uh, is x-ray therapy, right? You're treating things with x-ray, sort of like if you radiate a tumor here. Uh, the, the way the gamma knife uh, works is it's sort of like a CAT scan. It has a, a source that's shooting x-rays, but they're much, much higher energy x-rays. And it's, it spins around your, mainly your head area. Uh, and, um, and it deposits x-rays. Uh, and what happens is if you, you're constantly shooting x-rays, uh, where those x-rays beams cross, intersect, it, a lot of the energies get, it gets deposited, right? So they, they go around like this. So that's, it's a different, uh, different thing, but it's radiation therapy. So it's, it's a high dose I'm radiation. I'm aware of it because I had the gamma now. No, you had it, But yeah. I just wondered how the exposure compared. Well, actually, it's interesting. The exposure to the targeted area is very, very high, right? It's a therapeutic dose. But the, the way they have done, developed the technology, the exposure to the uh, surrounding brain is actually pretty low. You know, I'm still I'm sure it's more than a CAT scan. I mean, you, you can't get away with, with right. the depositing no that. Rides. Yeah, no free rides. But um, it's, it's compared to what it was, say, 15 or 20 years ago, where they'd, they'd actually have, would actually have brain damage around surrounding areas of the brain. That doesn't happen now. It's, it's amazing, the technology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my other question was, um, I'm a frequent flyer. Mm -hmm. And I'm not real crazy about an X-ray to get on a plane. Oh yeah, those are. Those and I are... read some very interesting things <clears throat> about how they adjust that equipment, and it was very poorly done. Yeah, yeah, I'm, that's not an area that I, I know that much about, except that they use a very, very low dose, and that it's created a lot of public uh, panic. Uh, that's, that's, but the actual impact on the radiation dose to patients is very, very, very small. I mean, much less than you get from the normal diagnostic x-rays that we take. How often are the CAT scans adjusted or whatever it is? Because I know you can have different adjustments. All right, so the, the uh, dosage uh, and the parameters that are set are highly regulated by the government and by us. So we have to calibrate our equipment every six months, all right, to make sure that they're giving the dose that we set on the dial, right? And then our protocols, how much dose we use, have to be below a certain level. And the, the manufacturers help us uh, get to that point, and then we police it. And you cannot, like the, the, that hospital down in, in L.A. That, that just cranked up the dose for those things, you can't do that. Yeah, the technologists can't do that. They actually have to go to the lead technologist uh, with a request and he has a key. I mean, it's, it's very regulated. So you can't suddenly get some wild technologist saying, well, I think I'll just hit this button by mistake kind of thing. It, that doesn't happen. So uh, I'm also the chairman of the Radiation Safety Committee and uh, we have to review that stuff all the time. It's, a, it's a highly regulated. It's, I know in the papers it seems, yeah, it's in the papers it seems like it's, oh, anything can happen, but I tell you, it's, it's, there's a lot of government uh, regulation uh, and we take it really seriously. Yeah, I was wondering, since uh, the CT scan seems to, you know, have so much uh, potential, you know, gives a, uh, you know, a good uh, dose of radiation, I'm just wondering about uh, techniques that uh, patients might uh, be able to have an effect of. I've, I read a little bit about studies of taking certain antioxidants right before a CT exam. If, you know anything about that? And I'm also uh, wondering about um, what do you think the what's on the horizon for uh, the future of the CT scan? Uh, you know, how how will these new technologies be disseminated? I I read about the GE uh, VO system, which I guess uses computer algorithms to use a lot lower dose and still get a, a fine the picture. Manufacturers are definitely working on ways to lower the dose, um, and the the coronary scans uh, now they have a 128 slice spiral scanner, which can lower the dose by, uh, I think, around half. Uh, th those exams um, haven't been done because the radiation dose is so high that we haven't done many coronary scans. So the manufacturers are definitely uh, trying to leapfrog each other to get the dosage down. Uh, but that takes a while. I mean, to, to plan it, all the physics involved, and then the technology. I mean, it takes years for, the, for you to, to do it. I don't know about the 
taking antacids. I have Clayton, have you heard anything about that? Not antacids, but an antioxidants. Antioxidants. I mean, vitamins, uh, vitamin C, D, I've, I've just... Uh, I, I haven't... Have a little study about that. That's interesting. I, I haven't heard about that, but I'm not sure it would... Uh, I'm not, yeah, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. But in terms of the future, uh, it, it's going to be amazing. You're, we're going to see probably a lot of molecular scanning coming on. So you're going to have things that will tag certain molecules in your body that you inject. And when you scan, you'll be able to find where those things go, right? So they go into metabolically active areas. And that is going to revolutionize medicine. Probably in the next 10 years, you're going to see some dramatic uh, improvements in terms. Now we just image the whole body, right? And we kind of look anatomically what we see, but these are going to be functional things. So we'll be able to see, uh, you know, they'll be able to tag stuff to look for a particular kind of like lung cancer, inject it in your body, scan the whole body, and you know, actually find it, or you name it. I mean, it's it's a pretty amazing stuff coming down the down the pike if if the research money hangs in there. <laughs> um, well, one last thing. Do you think a a patient uh, as, uh, could ask for a lower dose scan, uh, you know, to encourage, uh, you know, if, if the resolution isn't needed, would that uh, be uh, worthwhile to look into? Yeah, I think a patient can ask for the, you know, to the technologist, you know, to use the lowest dose possible. I mean, we already have our low, the dose as low as we think you need it based on the patient's size and what we're looking for. And I will say that when they, when we experimented with some much lower doses, uh, it was really ugly, the pictures. They were grainy, and I, I, I thought, well, you know, <laughs> I, it just it makes you really nervous that you're going to miss something. So uh, I think it's in, anything is possible. You can always ask for that. But, um, and the technologists will probably come to the radiologists and say, how low a dose can we get, get away with? But the smaller you are, the skinnier you are, the lower dose you can get away with. As you get bigger and the x-rays scatter all around, it makes things blurry unless you use a lot of x-rays. So it depends on the weight. Okay, weight. Thank you very much. Sure. Well, Dr. Nixon, thank you. You're I welcome. can tell this was a hit. <laughs>